Uh, I just felt to uh, to warm up and play and sing a song tonight. And this is a song that uh, came to me last week uh, when I was in Iceland. So it's a new one. <coughs> Soft and calm, it rests 
my mind in the dark with the candlelight it's you my lord i find it's you my lord i light it's you I find thank you thank you thank you Skava well, this is our warm-up. This is our staff movie night before the <laughs> the people start showing up. <laughs> so we get to have fun together with this movie tonight. Yeah, this, it was funny, we had our meeting over at Quantico uh, on the 11th. I guess that was a Saturday. And then Pete was thinking of this movie. I was at the other end of the table thinking of the movie but not thinking of the name. And then Pete was thinking of the movie with the name. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, it, it it kind of started to come in. It would be good for us to watch this. Anna had talked about how she had seen Frozen 2 uh, with her granddaughter in uh, Peru before she came here. And I really liked Frozen 1 and I, I really liked Frozen 2, but I think Frozen 2 it it got a little deeper into what's underneath the world. Like in, in Frozen 2, it was, you know, there is a story that was passed on from generation to generation to generation, and everybody just accepted the story. And then it it had a lot of limits, like all stories. And and very much like this world where, you know, things are passed on from generation, education's passed on, traditions are passed on, and there's a lot of limits with it. And then in Frozen 2 it turns out that Elsa is part of uh, a journey of discovery to, to see that the whole story is based on a lie. That the, a lie was at the origin of all the stories. And I thought, that really relates to this world very much. And it also relates to this movie we're watching tonight, City of Ember, because there's, there's just a lot of roles and traditions. And, and then there's usually, out of all the population, there's usually a, just a few that start to suspect that there has to be something more. Like, it just doesn't seem fulfilling. It just doesn't really feel that that love created this world because it's it doesn't have the fulfillment. There's so much scarcity in it. There's so much lack. There's so much dependency in it. Like everything in this world is said to be interdependent. All aspects of the environment and nature is inter interdependent. In this movie, we'll see we'll see that the city of Ember also is is very. Uh, dependent on external source for power and electricity and um, and so there's always like a lurking fear like if something gets turned off or something runs out just like in this world there's you know there's a fear of loss of enough food for the planet or en enough fuel for the planet uh, and there's all the concerns and yet nobody really knows how it all started. Everybody, you know, they say, well, the scientists postulate about the Big Bang and everybody's got theories, but nobody knows for sure. Nobody knows how it started. It's unfilling. Nobody knows where it's going, where it's headed. Uh, but it's basically, it's kind of like survival of humans on planet Earth and trying to make the best of the survival game. In this movie, they're basically trying to survive in City of Embers and there's no clue what's 
what's underneath it all and so I feel like that's something that with A Course in Miracles, you know, we, we are not only given the context that this generated, invented, fictitious world of duality uh, has nothing to do with reality. It's a dream. It's a dark dream. You can find little glimmers of happiness and joy in it, but you can't find everlasting happiness and joy in it. And yet, this uh, A Course in Miracles basically gives us the whole, the whole dynamics of why the ego made the world of time and space, how it keeps the mind trapped in the darkness, uh, how it keeps perpetuating a lie of an identity um, that's very frail, they're very fragile, very weak, and very much um, unfulfilling. Most everybody, I mean I get lots of emails each week and I just got one before I came over here of a woman that was feeling a lot of loss, she was feeling grief, she was feeling lonely, disconnected. She said, I've had A Course in Miracles on, on my bookshelf for for years but I've never read it and then somehow I came across your name. I don't even know if you'll answer this email but I hope you will. I need help. I, it was just a kind of a sending up like a flare in a desperate dark life of feeling very lonely and disconnected. Like, please, can you help me? Can you offer me some words of help at the very end? And so I wrote back to her and, and put some things in there about the movie watcher's guide to enlightenment and quantum forgiveness and said, yeah, maybe we have a call. But that's why we're showing this. I think what I like about this movie is there's a little spark in joining around, there must be more, and there must be a way out of this world. And if even if it's just two people coming together saying, there must be a way out, and I will find it. That's kind of how A Course in Miracles came with, with Helen Shuckman and her, her boss, Bill Thedford. Her, him saying it's how frustrating, and the Department of... Uh, Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, the psychology department, it's infighting, rumors, backstabbing, just not happy. You know, they were living, living and working in New York City and it was just unfulfilling, just a very unfulfilling work environment. Even though they're supposed to be psychologists helping people with their mental health, they couldn't escape the fact that they were not happy. They were not feeling very mentally stable and healthy at all. And then Bill, who was quite a, an eminent psychologist, uh, just turned to her and gave his little spiel, like, there must be a better way. And he thought that his colleague, you know, part of the department would just laugh at him or scoff at him, like, just, ah. But instead she turned to him and she said, you're right, there must be a better way and I'll help you find it. So in this movie we have two characters coming together like in kind of a, there must be an escape and I'll help you find it. But the devotion that they, it takes to hang with that when there's so many obstacles and witnesses that say, no, no, this is just, it's like that, that song, that's just the way it is, some things will never change. Of course, then he says, but don't you believe it? And that's what it takes the spark to really go home. And Jesus is a great way shower, and yet um, even with that it's kind of people are like always debating what what was he like and did did some people don't even believe there was a Jesus. Was, you know, in two thousand years people are like, Oh that's just too long ago. Nobody knows for sure and all these things. But there's this kind of message of hope this ray of light that came shining through the darkness, like there is an escape from this repetition, from this darkness, from this uh, world of separation and pain and suffering and guilt, where the major religions boldly pronounce that everyone's a sinner. Not the most optimistic planet uh, in, the, in the galaxies, you know, when the major religions say, everyone's a sinner, 
but you can escape if you believe in sacrifice and penance and suffering and that you're special and you're the one of the chosen ones. Not everyone, they say, escapes, just just the good ones. The rest, you know, it's, it's a dark, when, when that's the predominant religious system on the planet, then that is dark city, you know. We're, this, this is our, our uh, city of ember. And the ember is, sometimes you think of it in a, in a fire, an ember is just a glowing ember, it's just a faint glimmer of light. Uh, that's still there, that's still going in in a world of darkness. So so I think you'll enjoy it. I mean, I, I felt like one of the reasons to show it too was when I was feeling the movie there when we were over at Quantico was that not everybody has seen it and for those that have seen it, they don't remember much about it. <laughs> it's it's unmemorable. But but somehow Jesus would like us to see it. Maybe he wants us to remember it. Something about it. Like remember there's something important. Bill Murray's in it. Uh and uh Timothy Robbins is in it. Yeah. The last movie we saw when we were in Brazil, we were at uh, Luis's house and we saw Marjorie Prime, which Timothy Robbins was in that one too. And it was all it was these holograms when people, when their partner would pass away, they still had forgiveness lessons to do, so they would be given a, a hologram in their living room of the person. So they were gone, but not gone. They were, the hologram would kind of learn, 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 and then they would start getting, the more the time they'd spend with the hologram, they got more irritated and annoyed. <laughs> it was like, it's like they're not gone. <laughs> they're, they're still, all their grievances that they hadn't healed, uh, they got the chance with the hologram. But the best part for me was in the end, three, was it three or four holograms, three holograms bickering and arguing with each other. <laughs> All the humans had passed away, and the holograms were like nagging. No, that's not the way it happened. No, that's not. You know, they were nagging and arguing, and I thought, what a, what a commentary with the, the holograms arguing amongst each other. You know, that's that's pretty much a good uh, conceptual idea of the ego. It just projects out human beings, which are just un... It's just clinging to the past, and human beings are just acting out the idea that everything is not whole and complete. So everything is whole and complete, but the humans, and every time you have a reaction to any person, place, thing, animal, insect, whatever, it's still an aspect of the past that you still believe is real. And therefore, you're, it's like a grievance, it's an acted out grievance giving the mind one more chance and yet another chance to forgive, to release all aspects of the past and return to eternity. So that's kind of a different view of relationships. <laughs> Holograms acting out the past. People want to get into relationships and then the ones who get into relationships as they define it, want to get out of the relationships, are looking for better relationships something different, some kind of change, you know, get me out of this. And so it's either, that's the human condition, longing to get in or longing to get out. And yet the overall condition of the world is there has to be something beyond this world. So we'll just enjoy it, City of Ember. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you get it? <laughs> You know what's in the box. See, the reason the course is so frightening is because it's it's kind of like the box. It has the instructions. And people open it up and many people look in it and they go, Mmm, it's pretty it's got some instructions in it, but it's pretty radical inside the box, inside the book. And it's 
the text is radical enough, but then when you get to those early lessons, and you start doing the lessons, you know, nothing I see means anything, and then you get on to the, these thoughts do not mean anything. My meaningless thoughts are showing me a meaningless world. It's basing, basically teaching you that you, as you perceive yourself, don't exist. And that's why everyone's afraid of the Course. Because it's teaching you that you are love and you are spirit. But the you that you think you are, in all that you've worked for, in all your future ambitions, in everything that you've ever done, is not real, it's not even happening. In fact, when the Course says the world was over long ago, it means that everything that you perceive was over. It's long ago. It's not still happening. And that's why there's such uncomfort. You know, Jesus says, you may feel uncomfortable. You know, he gives you the first 12 lessons and then he starts in on number 13. But I was just listening to myself when I was reading the lessons that some of you listened to. He starts in with number 13, a meaningless world engenders fear. And then when you go to the bottom of lesson 13, Jesus drops the atomic bomb. A meaningless world engenders fear because I think I'm in competition with God. So he introduces the cause and effect relationship where all this fear is coming from. If God is love, and God created you as perfect love, the perfect love and light, Christ child, then the only way that this world would, would generate fear is if you believe your idea of who you are is different than God's idea of who you are. That's what generates the fear. If you're flesh and God created you as spirit, then that means, oh, it's not a soccer game competition. Oh, it's not a competition between the men and the women. Oh, it's not a competition between the countries. It's not a competition between all the things, companies competing for customers. No, that's all a projection of the competition idea. It's, it's the, uh, the belief in the mind that you can be something different than God created you, engenders fear. Not the world. It's the belief that you can be something that you're not. So underneath all disease, all striving, all struggles, all concerns, all worries, if you go down into the box, and you follow the box, <laughs> and you follow the inevitable instructions, <laughs> you follow the clues and signs, you will go into an experience that shows you who you are. But it also renders this world as completely unnecessary. So it's an experience. He did, Jesus doesn't say in the Course, a theology will come that when you're doubting. Oh, we found the hidden theology. Now we know what to believe. No, he doesn't say a theology will come to end your doubting. He says an experience will come. Experience of joy. What did Ken post the other day on the internet? Truth is joy. You said it was like it bowled you over when you saw that in the Course. One sentence, truth is joy. But that's what it is. So it must mean that we simply join in purpose. We join, we collaborate, we communicate, we we openly communicate, we fully communicate. We realize we don't have any secrets, we don't have any private thoughts. And in the end, why is that important? Is because Jesus says, wouldn't you want to enter the holy instant where you know who you are? If you would enter the holy instant, you cannot keep any 
thoughts to yourself. You would keep nothing hidden. You would simply have, he says, wouldn't you rather be in communication with everything and everyone? Simultaneously, really. That's what heaven is. To be in total communication, even beyond the words, just, just a known light, a known communication. So I think that's maybe why when I first saw this movie, I was like, wow, there are all these roles, there's always, I, I think somebody suggested the movie The Giver for our, our, that's always one of the classics. It's kind of more of a, a sophisticated, they get sophisticated roles and then one, one gets to be the receiver. And then we get to know about The Giver and then that, that movie's kind of like a, another version of City of Ember. But it's all about escape. And isn't that different from the programming that, that says you can somehow survive and have a life in form and strive to chase that elusive happiness are we there yet? Are we happy yet? You know, with possessions, with accumulations, with all kinds of personal adventures. Jesus calls it the, in the hero of the dream section, the serial adventures of the body is the hero. This is what uh, Joseph Campbell, he did all of his research of all the past generations, what he called mythology. But Jesus tells us that all mythology is illusion. Everything that we seem to discover about the past or what happened was all just the hero's journey, just the adventures of the body. He calls it the serial adventures of the body. You've heard of serial killer? This is serial birth, <laughs> serial life in the body and serial death. It's the serial adventures of dreams. And even the, the so-called way showers that say, you know, you can, you can have it all, you can have a great life. You know, I remember when I was growing up, they said, dream your dreams, dream your dreams, make your dream happen and make your dream come true. Does anybody remember that? You know, what a bunch of hooey. And that was supposed to satisfy us, that we make our dreams come through, come true. But when, when does that end? It's just this, another a, a cat chasing its tail, around and around in circles, dizzy and confused, because <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't lead anywhere, you know. But there is a, even Jesus will use that metaphor, he will say, he says, Happy dreams come true, but not because they're dreams. It's because of the happy. That's the point of life, is to be happy. The trick is to thinking, tying it to the dreams. If I get enough money, if I get a life that looks a certain way, if I achieve, accumulate, accomplishment, learn, Jesus, you know, in this world, learning is supposed to be a great thing. The more you learn, the better. Jesus says, you've been learning for so long. You learned this whole world and you never paused to ask yourself why you were learning it. Because if you had paused, you would have thought, what is the point? <laughs> what is the point to time and space? What is the point to existence in the body? What what is the point? What is the purpose? So there's a part two in the course when you get back into the late chapters where Jesus comes out and he says, all of the roadways of the world lead to death. And men have died upon seeing this. But if they had just taken one more step they, their learning could have led to heights of happiness. 
So one more step past the disillusionment of all the roadways lead to death. It's a closed system. The five senses are part of the ego, so that's why we can't find God, we can't find the spirit through the five senses. That just perpetuates the, the false chase for nothing. But they, all the mystics and saints said, be still, meditate, pray, go within. The truth is within you. That's why all the saints and mystics have taught the same thing for generations. Is It's inside. It's not inside the body, but it's inside a quiet, still mind. That's the little river <laughs> at the end <laughs> that goes down, down, down and takes you like it carries you out of, of the dream world. So it's quite, quite a letting go of everything. Everything you think you think and think you know. But I promise you, the more clueless you become, the more you really start to feel, I don't know what anything, including this, is for. I do not know what anything is for. I promise you that is where the happiness is. What they call it, clueless, carefree, and carried. That literally, they were literally carried. <laughs> the, little the little girl who happened to come along, they needed her on the trip. <laughs> Because they didn't know what to do. She would like intuitively know just what to do when they, when they got to a stuck point. When they couldn't figure out the instructions. And a little child, the Bible said, will lead them. <laughs> That's when she came in there. Yeah, I think that's pretty profound. Because most of the movie, you know, you could, it's just showing the, the hustle, the bustle, the busyness, the survival. I think when I first watched this movie, I was like, wow, that's just showing the struggle for survival. Entropy, as they call it in science, everything moving to chaos and decay and destruction is the principle of entropy. And then the mind is ingenious enough with the ego to fool itself into believing that there's something you can make a haven of happiness in the middle of, a, of an entire time-space world of entropy where everything moves towards destruction. <laughs> it's kind of a, an interesting trick. The good life, the, the good dream, the good pursuit even when the mayor was making his talks, like, okay, the power's going out, the city's falling apart, everything's going, we will form a task force mm -hmm. to find hope of light in the darkness. <laughs> that was so good. A task force. Oh, sure, that's going to really do it. <laughs> it's like a politician saying, we will form a task force. <laughs> Almost like, have hope, your fearless leaders <laughs> will <laughs> will lead you out of darkness and chaos. <laughs> Again, when we look at planet Earth, let's just look over the history in the last centuries, you know, let's look at the fearless leaders. Hitler, did he, did he lead us out? Mussolini, Osama bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, Donald Trump, <laughs> anybody placing any bets <laughs> on the fearless leaders? <laughs> and even the ones that, that really did not hold political office like Mahatma Gandhi, he said the way was through nonviolence and peace. That sounds more like go inside. Gandhi was a Hindu, but 
they asked him one time about the Bible and Jesus and he said, they asked Gandhi, what do you think about the teachings of Jesus? And he said, oh, I love to read that stuff. I love to read about Jesus. Yogananda loved to read about Jesus. We met, uh, I met Muji when we were over in Sahaja and uh, Muji was so happy to tell us that if we walked up the, the mountain, walked a certain way, we would see this little chapel. They built a Jesus chapel and Muji hand painted the paintings in his little Jesus chapel. And Muji's a great devotee of Jesus. And he painted all these paintings in there. I had to take your shoes off to go in there like we do here. But it's, it's the, the way showers are the ones that say peace, find the peace. Don't find it by trying to make something of yourself in this world, but from surrendering. That's what all the, the great mystics and saints and avatars, they've advocated surrender, let go. Let go of trying to make a life. It goes completely against all the conditioning because this is a world of striving. You have to strive for everything, strive for absolutely everything. But how delightful to know that if you actually let go, everything will work out better than fine. <laughs> Spectacularly, just by letting go. What's every, what everyone think of the movie? Well, it was really beautiful. Like this day since I came here, I'm feeling this terrible fear that I have never experienced in my life. Like, it's funny that you're talking about, um, about the fear. And yes, I'm feeling like I'm going to die. So, like right now, came to my mind my family, and, and yes, I'm afraid to let go of Daniela and my family. Like, what's going to happen with me? And it it hurts me so much. I mean, I'm I've always loved these these movies about like they always find a way. You see, they go into the really dark to get to the light. But I'm so afraid of the dark. <laughs> yeah. But I don't want to look at it. Yeah, I don't want to. I'm I'm scared. And then I'm shaking again. <laughs> yeah. So and I don't know how to let go if I have to stay with this fear until it disappears. I mean I feel like lost because I'm not feeling the love that I wanted to feel here, you know. I'm just feeling so dark, like I have never felt in my life. Yeah, it was very, it's very courageous for you to come. It's like, I think a lot of us can relate to those times in our life where we've taken a step, but it it, I think a lot of the fear is just the, like the uncertainty, like it's almost like we're just kind of giving ourselves permission to kind of move away from what is familiar and our families, our country, our, our friends, you know, it's all, it's all familiar. And yeah, it was beautiful ever since you really felt that you would come, then the conversations we've had, or the type chats conversations has been, yeah, my family's afraid for me, and then that one day my boyfriend is afraid for me, and then you wrote, can you have a call with my boyfriend? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I think, I think there'll be time in the afternoon, and so, yeah, that was good because you you got your boyfriend on Facebook Messenger <laughs> and then you were at a different location on your phone and he was on his phone and I would, so I would barely see his face 
I was seeing the, everything around him and I would see a forehead occasionally and I'd see a nose or a little patch of hair and then he would be going like this <laughs> and he was like, I'm very concerned, I'm just very afraid. I'd see a little eyebrow. I'd, I'd, I'm very concerned about Daniela and, and so I just need to talk to you. I need to talk to you and I need to, let's see, an, uh, another ear. I, I need to know that it's safe. And, and you are the, what was the word he used? It, there was a word like the, yeah, you're the one that she trusts to follow. And then I, I said, well, I, I mentioned A Course in Miracles, I mentioned the box. He said, no, 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 it's you. That's why I'm talking to you. <laughs> and he says, Daniela has told me that she has talked to your staff. But that's the staff. And that doesn't help. It could be anybody. It could be a fake website. It could be a fake staff. For all I know, it could be a fake staff. But I need to talk to you, so I just need to know that it's safe. And pardon my English, pardon my English, I said, no, no, your English is better than my Spanish. I said, you're, <laughs> you're ahead. So we had a nice talk and then it was good, five or ten minutes and he said, okay, okay, I'm convinced. <laughs> it took that, even every little step, even the, the talk with the boyfriend, yeah. He's still afraid. <laughs> He's like, can you text me in the morning and in the after, in the at night? So I see you. you know, I'm okay. Just trust. I'm okay. I'm like, well, I'm not okay. <laughs> I'm just crying. I, I tell him I'm just crying all the time. Well, if he gets too scared during the week, then you can put me on the put my eyebrow or on my ear on the phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's. It's like I want to get to the experience, but yeah, I don't know how to let go. I'm so yeah, the uncertainty is really strong for me. Yeah, and the fear. I didn't know that I was so afraid till I get here. Uh, since the airplane, it was like everything was going wrong, and I was like, should I supposed to go there? Everything is going like the wrong way, like the. We have a lot of turbulence, and when I was uh, leaving my country, like I was so afraid, like the policeman was uh, <laughs> believing that I have drugs, <laughs> and then the policeman was like, "It was a policewoman," <laughs> and she was like, "Where are you going? Uh, to see who?" And I was like, <laughs> "I was so nervous that <laughs> I probably look guilty." <laughs> so I was like, "Oh my God, this is all in my mind, but I don't. Oh, what do I do?" and I cried all the all the all the plane to Mexico DF. I was crying because this is going to fall <laughs> because it was so I mean I'm not afraid of flying I swear but I don't know that time I feel like I was going to death. Yeah. <laughs> so since I came here I've been yeah it's been crazy. Well you notice when they finally got on the the boat mm -hmm. and then they went down 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 and everything when they reached that place the signs one step at a time. Mm -hmm. One sign said, don't push. You remember at the end, you know, it was like those are all the the soft messages from spirit. Mm -hmm. The signs were just like, you know, just relax. Like all you can do is re is relax. It takes actually everything you have just to, just to relax and say, okay, I'm here and, and I trust it and I got this far, so I'm just going to going to trust. Because when we show up with trust like that, then then the Spirit will will speak through you through different people. I mean, with all these ones we have coming, what is there, about 40? We have about 40 coming. And they're, they're, they want the same thing. They want to experience. They want to feel happy. They want to feel peaceful. And they're trusting to come many of them for the first time and 
When we were in uh, Mexico City, we actually gave them the choice at the end of the gathering. We said, do you want to do an online uh, retreat or, and we could hardly even say the alternative. All of a sudden, everybody in the audience was like, Chapala! Chapala! I said, okay, get the flyers. Where are those flyers? We, we just brought them along in case. Chapala! You know, so, so they're coming, but, but I think it's nice to, when you think of it, like, oh yeah, that's right. Everybody's coming for the same experience. Everybody's taking one little step away from the familiar and one step towards what seems to be uncertainty, even though at some point maybe it will tip, it will flip, where what seemed to be so familiar starts to not, be, not feel so familiar anymore. And then what starts to arise in you is what you wanted, the, the peace. And, you know, that's what we've talked about when you say, oh, it's, my mind goes crazy when I start to think about the, my body or how I would like my body to be versus how it is, you know, the judgments and the comparison. It's, it does feel like a, like a torment, like a prison. And there's something inside you that says there has to be something beyond these thoughts every day because it doesn't feel good to, to be like, kind of addicted to comparison, you know, it's like it's, it's a very hard addiction. It seems to be even more intense than what people call physical addictions, this, this nagging kind of stress and pressure, you know, somehow to, to be different than we are or should be better, I should, why doesn't this, you know, we've talked about that other works, seems to work for other people, why doesn't this work for me? How can it work for them and not for me? And the anger, I should, it should be fair. It should be fair. If it works for them, it should work for me, you know. And yeah, you get into all those kind of games and, and then you say, well, gee, I don't really know how I'm going to get out of this. And none of them really knew. I, I just could see they all would... They would go annually to that assignment day and none of them really looked happy. They all looked kind of nervous and kind of, you could just see it in the, the girl's face, you know. Like she didn't really want to pick anything out of that hat. She just, she reached in and nothing came out and he's like, go ahead, pick. And she did not want to stick her hand in there and pick something. Then when she picked it out and opened it up, what was it? Pipe? Pipe worker. Pipe worker. Oh, she was just like, oh God, <laughs> imagine. Imagine your lot in life coming on Simon's Day and you got a pipe worker. She was not happy until her friend said, I'll trade you <laughs> for messenger <laughs> that she had. She went off running. That was like something she could handle, but not pipe worker. He didn't really want to be a pipe worker either, but he he wanted to get to the generator, which is kind of the source. He wanted to get to the source of power. some An escape from this dread of it's all going to crash or it's all going to break down. Well, thank you. That's probably why you were carrying the, holding the microphone, <laughs> because <laughs> Jesus wanted you to speak, <laughs> so you got you got the microphone. <laughs> it's about like um, it seems like we we need to do. Um, Forced task to save all the people from this world, you know, like yeah, I don't know if it's clear, but it's something about this, like how to escape without judging this world. What well, was I thought it was good at the very beginning when when they were talking about in order to save people from pain and suffering and and uh, everything, they would, they would make a world, it's very much like The Giver, the movie The Giver, where they try to make 
a world that's peaceful. And they actually have a lot of rules in this made up world to be peaceful. Like you, you can't even, you get corrected even if you use the wrong word. With, what was it called? Precision of, precision of language. Even if you make a mistake and you say a word that's too vague, it's not precise enough and not defined enough, then, then, then you get a warning. Precision of language, that even about the words that are used. But I thought it was kind of interesting that they were making a world and they just arbitrarily picked 200 years and then they would, it was almost like the, there would be an escape or there would be an end to the world. But they were going to try to give people a world without worries and concerns. Yet it was very secluded. It, they were, of all places to put it too, underground. Like, so their desire was to have a peaceful world, but they built it underground and they put a time limit on it. So to me, the escape comes just like with the Frozen 2. The, the problem that Elsa couldn't see, that Annie, was it Annie, the sister, Anna, Anna Elsa couldn't see it, Anna couldn't see it, the snowman couldn't see it, the, what was the guy's name? He couldn't see it, none of them could see it, because it all started with a lie. They were told the whole city, the whole city, the whole community was told a lie at the beginning, and everybody just accepted the lie. lie. In fact, I love the Martin Landau character in here because he was the, the guy that was always falling asleep and the, the kid was saying, what's this? And he's saying, I, I don't know. And he said, you're supposed to know everything. You've been here the longest. And, you know, and then whenever he would get tasked with something, doing something important or whatever, he would just say the phrase, it's not my job. <laughs> You know, I mean, talk about projection. He just nobody seemed to be curious, and nobody was encouraged to go deep or to dig deep. In fact, she was told by maybe her aunt or something, "Don't, don't dig too deeply." It's very obvious that this everything was defending against something. Like the question really is, what is it for? What is underneath it all? That's the one question nobody seemed to be interested in in asking or receiving an answer for it. Don't dig too deep and it's not my job, it's not my concern. Even on assignment day, you know, everybody's just supposed to accept the assignment. Not even question what's underneath it. It was all like this survival thing for Ember to survive. Pipes and generators and all kind of messengers and everything. Yeah, it, it's just I mean, very much like this world, it's like you're, you're given all these things to do and, and sometimes it's from the family or the tradition. I have a friend, Seema, who was born to an Indian family and she was on one of our online retreats recently and she said, yeah, it, even before I was born, the family knew that what I would be before I even came out. And when, so when she was born, they all cheered and they all were happy. They went, a doctor is born. <laughs> Before she took a breath, she was the, the great doctor of the family because the family had decided her life, what she would study and what she would do. And she became a doctor. And then all of a sudden she had to start to unlearn and reverse and undo everything. So she's been really at that but talking to me for years about undoing the the whole medical doctor concept but but the escape Jesus says this late in the in the text he says salvation and he does define salvation he says salvation is for the mind so you don't save people you know how a lot of religions say are you saved you don't save people you don't save the planet you don't save the solar system you don't save Mother Nature, you don't save the rainforest, you don't save money, you don't, you don't save countries, you don't save poor people, you don't save sick people. 
Jesus tells us only the mind is in need of salvation. Well, that's good to be told by the way shower actually what needs to be saved. He says only the mind needs salvation. And then he tells us one other important thing, it's only saved in one way. He tells us what needs to be saved, in the same sentence he tells us how to do it. One sentence he's giving the whole keys to the kingdom. Only the mind needs salvation, needs to be salvaged, he said, and it's only salvaged through peace. So he gives the means and he gives what? So that's that's a good start for the escape right there. Because you have the way shower, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, the one who has already escaped. Who it's not like he escaped something real, he saw it was a hallucination and he woke up to the truth. So it's it's not like it's a salvation of something that's even some, still going on. It just seems to be going on, like it seems to be a hallucination. And, and saved through peace, that just must mean, it must mean if I follow the instruction manual instead of the, what's in the box, if I follow the blue book, it was actually at the beginning green book in England, but if I follow, for this metaphor, the blue book, and I follow the instructions, and he even says in the course, if, if you're finding this course to be difficult, it's not that the course is difficult, he says. It, perhaps you have not done what it asks. Well, that's pretty good. An instruction manual that takes you back to heaven, and it's not hard, and it's really not difficult. He said, this is a course in the, in the easy and the obvious. It's a course in the obvious. And then he says, this course is not a play of ideas. So he said, don't just play around and tinker around with this, like, oh, and recite it and make posters and sing songs and do all this stuff and do lectures and make your career out of talking about the don't. No, this is not a play of ideas. This is actually about coming into an experience and that will set you free. He says, if an experience will, will come along to set you free, it will end your doubting, he says, an experience. He doesn't say a theology. He doesn't throw anything out. He doesn't say, you'll flip the switch. No, he just says an experience will come. And so basically he's encouraging us to go for that experience. So I think it's, it's good, and like you and I were talking the other day, he doesn't really ever say, repeat the lessons. You know, if you go through those lessons sincerely and you, it even says at the end of the lessons, the last five lessons, you know, you know, this holy instant what I give to you, be you in charge. It's basically saying the whole lessons are just to put you in touch with Jesus or the internal teacher and then, then your lessons are complete. Then henceforth follow the voice for God, follow your guidance. From there, it doesn't say you have to ritualistic just do these lessons over and over, year after year. It's like it's putting up a Christmas tree. Okay, let's get a Christmas tree, and who's got the lights and the tinsel? You know, he doesn't want a bunch of rituals. He wants you to follow the instructions and follow the guidance so you can share your joy and share your happiness. But in the end, the he does use the escape word fairly early in the workbook. The first time he mentions escape is workbook lesson 23, which I think is pretty significant because that's the first time he mentions the escape word. And he says, I can escape the world I see. If it's a hallucination, he's basically saying I can escape the hallucination by giving up attack thoughts. And what are attack thoughts but judgments? What are attack thoughts but grievances? Our real thoughts that God gave us are not attack thoughts. And people always go, I don't even know what a real thought is. All I know is attack thoughts. And I say, well, I am as God created me as a real thought. That's a real thought. I am a spirit. I am not a body, I am free, I am still as God created me. That's a real thought, I am still as God created me. 
it's like that has to be underneath a whole haystack full of of attack thoughts. There has to be a golden needle that's maybe it's buried under a lot of hay, but it's still there. It doesn't mean that needle is gone. I am as God created me. So, so you were asking about the escape process. There's different times in the course. I mean, there's one section called I Need Do Nothing where he says, if you really want to show loyalty to me, Jesus says, this is the most important thing you can do. Is say and mean, I, I need do nothing. Now, when you try to really be loyal and do that, then you notice the ego is like, oh, be practical, yeah, you know, you, you know, it, it comes in with its practical things, and what about this, and what about this. But just for a moment, what if, if that route of just giving yourself over to that, I need do nothing, I, I don't have to say I should do anything. I should please my parents, I should please, I should do the right thing for society, I should, I should follow Michael Jackson's song, Heal the world, make it a better place for you and for me and the whole human race. No, not that even. We're not even going to try to make the human race better, because the ego made the human race. <laughs> so. It's not really a good goal. <laughs> Seek not to change the world. Wow, that's, that's an interesting one to follow. To try to have a motive of peace without trying to make the world a better place. That goes against all the, the programming too. You know, there's so much of the programming when we grew up as... I remember I was taught things like um, Whenever you visit a place or you, you're in a room or whatever, always leave the room in better condition than when you entered it. That's what I was taught. Always leave the room in better condition than when you entered it. So I'd be like, looking around, did I, <laughs> did I mess anything up? Did I, I can't leave any dirt or fingerprints or footprints or anything, you know, leave leave it a better place than you found it, you know, and there's all kinds of things. Another one was, if you can't say anything good about someone, don't say anything at all. The ego finds that very difficult. <laughs> don't say anything. <laughs> it's like, hush! <laughs> you know? You can't say anything good, but that's pointing to more what's your thoughts. Because if you have judgmental thoughts, it's not doesn't matter much whether you say them or not. Because Jesus says it's it's not your behavior that needs to change. Because Jesus even says, I was just listening to that from our lesson. Was it lesson thirteen or something? <laughs> so I was like. I missed the day. I said, oh, okay, well, whatever. <laughs> We're one day behind. Okay, whatever. But we got to the one where he said, he was basically saying that he had to work with our thoughts because if, if we hand our thoughts over to Jesus and let him handle everything that does not matter, which is the body, the puppets, everything of time and space, and everything works out beautifully. But, if we try to correct the behavior, then we still think we're doing something real. And he says, nope, there is no change at that level. You, you can change the behavior, but that is not any change at all. It's almost like it's totally insignificant. Like you are fooling yourself if you think you can correct and control at the behavioral level. Because that's a projection, and and the problem is a misperception anyway. And you can't make the correction in the form, you have to make the correction in the mind. So I think that's another key. The mind needs to be healed, it's only healed through peace. And if you start to realize that your joy and your happiness is given you in this moment, and that you can 
come under guidance, under the guidance of Jesus. We talked about that on the group talk that we did with, uh, with your group in Brazil, that if you can come under that guidance, then that's it. You, you're right in the, the tractor beam of the escape. And then he does say everybody is given a special function. So whatever it seems to look like, but that special function has to be given moment by moment by the, the Holy Spirit or Jesus. It's not where we kind of decide on our own, oh, I want to be this or I want to be that. Like those assignments, you know, we can, we can put all these names and make up what we're going to do, but that doesn't really get us anywhere unless we just listen and follow the joy, the inspiration. In one sense, you do have to let go of the programming because if you follow the programming from the past, there's there's going to be lots of shoulds and ought tos. I, I don't want to let this one down, I don't want to let this one down. You were saying when we went to the mall the other day, you said, my mom wants a baby. Yeah. And she was saying, I need you to give me a baby. <laughs> what do you think about that, Gabriel? <laughs> Have you consulted with her? <laughs> but that's just a funny thing, you know, of having somebody tell us, I need you to give me a baby. Wow, that's a, that's a good one. But, you know, that's how... That's how it can be with families and expectations and roles. roles. Like my friend Seema, the whole family, we need you to be a doctor. Even before she's born, she's the doctor of the, of the Indian family. <laughs> and then she, of course, has to fulfill, you know, she believes she had to play it out to, to be the doctor. It didn't make her happy, but but that was part of a destiny karma, whatever you want to call it. But then there's something beyond the karma. What's beyond the karma? That's a good question. What's beyond the karma? John Lennon said instant karma. There we go. Does that help any? Is that good? No? <laughs> These characters, like the the um, um, singer, the woman that that was so apparently happy and joyful with the singing, like yeah. she bought it, she she totally bought it. Yeah. But uh, it it doesn't feel happy, even though it apparently looked happy because she was always smiling and everything. But the conditions and the whatever is around, and and we. It brought to mind this this idea we we want to believe something so badly that we for completely forget how we feel, and we leave the the script right we, we we create a script in our minds and we sort of try and make everything fit in, no matter what's happening, we make it fit in, and then we disconnect from our feelings, don't we, and that's the trap, yeah. Yeah, I, I did notice the singer kind of seemed happy, but then when I, I watched more, you know, in terms of the singing ritual every year, and then they all they sing the same same songs. Then I started to listen to the lyrics of the song, and it was more of like we're hoping for the light. They're hoping for something one day in the future. So it was like well, the more you really go inside the singing. And then you could say, well, if my if the miracle is involuntary, then that must be, that could be something that would be wonderful would be to have spontaneous involuntary singing, which I sometimes do in my gatherings. <laughs> but it's not planned. I have no it's it's very involuntary, just like the words are very involuntary for me. So so I don't ever have the thought, will I sing today or not, or 
will they will people like the singing or not or will they boo boo or you know no we want nada 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 you know i don't have any of these th thoughts i i because it's entirely involuntary it's not there's not a thought for it and and in one sense that's I think that's what really Jesus wants us to live is an involuntary life where we get, we focus so much on our purpose, so much on our function, so much on just happiness, present happiness, present joy, lightness, ease, connectedness. We focus on that and then everything just flows from that state of mind. So we're not then in the doer. We can't if if I'm not thinking about singing as an action, and to me it's just a state of mind, like the song of prayer. If I'm in the song of prayer, and I'm in the connection, the alignment, the joy, and everything, then yeah, then it won't be seen as a thing. And that's a lot what like Netta others will do with voice liberation. They just have people start to relax and start to sing without judging whether they're singing good or bad, without comparing, you know, first to get, like with the, the movie, that was what she was working with with Soren, was just singing. And Jeffrey, yeah, Jeffrey's singing. Jeffrey, we've shown that movie sometimes and somebody will be in the audience and they'll go, Jeffrey! Oh gosh, man, you singing there. I can't, don't know if I can make it all on my own. Oh my God, that's all I needed in the whole movie. Just to see, you know, they're just so happy that they saw Jeffrey just going for it without any concern, you know, because Netta was saying, just, just do it. And then she would say, you know, to Susanna, you can join in at any time, no pressure, just, just, you can join in. And she was just inviting them to sing and inviting them to express. And then it just, there's something would break when they, when they both break, burst into laughter after all that tension. And then they burst into laughter and they get these big smiles on their faces. Everybody feels it. Because it's like, oh my God, that's healing. Whatever that, whatever's happening here, that's that's what I want. I want like that. And then we showed it in the in the monastery, and I watched that session. Soren was getting beamed in from from Spain, I think. And then when they were starting to wrap up the session, I watched the whole center row leaning. Soren. Soren, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, <laughs> they just like, they were just so grateful for what they experienced and they had him there talking, like, Soren, Soren, hey Soren, you know, it's like, yeah. because, because there's that joy of, of it being involuntary. I think that's, people could relate when he just started, you could see it all over his face, you know, and people could relate to that. They knew he wasn't acting. You could call it a movie, but he was not acting. <laughs> that, he was like really struggling and then she, she said, yeah, I don't believe you. When he's trying to talk about, sing about trust, he could barely sing or say the words. And then, then she said, well, let's try something else. Sing, I don't trust you. I don't trust you, and he just, <laughs> oh yeah, he could sing that. Because why? Because why? It was authentic. And that's what, what's trending now on planet Earth. <laughs> Authenticity is really trending. <laughs> why do people like Instagram? Authentic photographs, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, they, I mean, it all depends on your motive, but they, they, they do like to see stories, they like to see what's going on, like, don't just show me your website image, show me what's happening, you know,
behind the scenes. Give me the give me the whole picture. Don't just give me a presentation or an image. Give me I want more. And I think that's that's beautiful that that's trending now because that to me is just a call for more spontaneity and more uh, transparency. Transparency is cool. <laughs> <laughs> It's trending. <laughs> Stephanie's like, oh, okay, now, now the microphone drops into my lap. Yeah, first of all, thank you that I can be here. That's really... Very, I'm very grateful. Um, and all this, um, I feel very welcomed, and and all this love I received here in these few days I've been here is like a lot of tears and a lot of joy. Um, actually, when you mentioned about the, um, or in the movie was the um, potato peeler, <laughs> and then you mentioned it, and because we were um, peeling potatoes today in the kitchen, <laughs> 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 so it was so. And I had the prayer this morning actually to uh, yesterday. Or my prayer today was just not to focus on the lack, but on what I have. In, I want every every time I want to come back on this, and then I can give, but because I focus on what I have, and I, and I can give. And um, the potato peeling was giving, and I'm so glad that this came now again. And um, yeah, it gave me really an experience of. Um, yeah, you can give everything a purpose. It's it's really potato peeling. <laughs> but it was really, we had such a joyful moment in the kitchen. And, um, and yeah, it's, this is really a, an experience. Yeah. And uh, back to this movie also, at the end when they came to the light and you mentioned Chapala, and I said, oh my God. <laughs> I th you know, it's like this um, call and the steps I was following, it was like really... Um, yeah, somehow it's like, wow, yes, there are these all kind of happenings and, and somehow it was really beautiful to, yeah, to see I'm in Chapala now. <laughs> yeah. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a kind of, a, it's a nice idea to just start to, just open to the idea that everything Everything, without exception, is happening for for the mind. Not not so much for the person, but for the mind. And then, you know, you start to relax into that and then, you know, just start to appreciate the potato peeling or we went out, Slava and I went out with Gabrielle and Paulina to the mall and First to the black coffee, and then a walk into the back, and then when we went into these shops at the back, it just, I just have this strong feeling like, oh, here we go. It's, this is so much fun because it's all for us. And then the, the owner was there, and oh, he was trying, we were trying on, Gabriel was trying on different uh, jackets or coats, and 
you were saying on the way in, oh, Paulina, she's the one who picks the clothes and dresses, and she was quick. She was busy looking, picking, and then he was there, and then, and then so I was, oh, there's a shop next door, and I said, another one, another clothes shop, and yeah, two clothes shops in in my mall back to back. I was, like, and then she's like, she goes over there, and then, and she said, oh yeah, and the owner said that uh, they're they're going out of business, so. 30, he's going to give me 30% off. So she went over and checked on a jean jacket and then checked on things. And then sure enough, you know, he said, yes, one more hour. The the store will be open for one more hour. I mean, I and I was having that feeling, this is all for us, you know, like this whole thing is like a quantum moment is arranged. How many times you walk into a store and they go, we'll have the store open one more hour, then the store will close completely so you can have 30% off. And so I was already, I was like, oh, this is, this is, this is all for us. And so it got lighter and more and more playful because there was a, a beautiful gold three-dimensional love sign there and then decoration and then Svava and Paulina were both saying, "Oh, we want that. We want. The, we. How much will that be? You know, they started trying to buy the <laughs> before the before the they, they they got away from the clothes. They got to the. They wanted to buy the love. You know, and I watched. They wanted to buy the love, and then the owner. I was like, because I was like, this is getting more fun by the moment. I looked at the owner, and he said, "No, that is not for sale." That is not for sale, but I'll give it to you for free. And I was like, oh boy. And trying to buy the love, it's not for sale. Remember the Beatles? Can't buy me love. Everybody tell me so, including the shop owner. And I'm like thinking, oh, John, ring, John is heaven, and uh, George are having so much fun with us in the store. And then, sure enough, but. Yeah. <laughs> then we got it home and we found out it had batteries and then and, and you turn it on and lights and we had to get new batteries for it and but you know it just it's it's more that feeling it's all for one purpose and it's just for the purpose like Jesus said only your mind needs salvation and it's only through the peace or the love or the laughter or the joy so that and you can start to just feel it, like, oh, the Spirit is so playful with everything. You can just let it start to transfer to everything that you perceive. And that's the escape. You know, it's not to take anything seriously, not to take anything in a heavy way or... I mean, when I was raised, I would ask people about things, like I was quite curious when I was younger about this uh, thing called guilt. I really had some questions about guilt. And also I was, I always would question when my parents would say these two words to me over and over and over. They just repeated them over and over and over. David, don't. David, don't. David, don't. David, don't. It just was, don't. David, don't. David, don't. Recently, I there's this woman that I, she says we should never, we should not correct our children. The children don't need to be disciplined. I posted that on my Facebook wall. Children do not need to be disciplined. It's not the child that is in, in error. It's the perception of the parent <laughs> that, that, is in, that is there for correction. Not the child. The correct, so I posted that. But I always used to say I thought that was my last name after a while because it was <laughs> was so often repeated. But then with the guilt, when I would talk to people, they would say, "Yeah, well, you know, guilt does have some useful purposes." And I would say, "Really?" And they'd say, "Yeah, don't you know? There's good guilt, and then there's bad guilt." 
and I'd say, what's the difference between the good guilt and the bad guilt? And they'd say, the good guilt keeps you from doing things that you shouldn't. And the bad guilt just doesn't feel good. So I said, you, but I was strange as saying, so there's such a thing as good guilt? Yeah, you know. That's like when your parents say, you should feel guilty. Because they're talking about good guilt. But, but that, I never could understand. It didn't seem right. I couldn't really believe that there was good guilt. And then when I got to Jesus in the Course, he said, there is one thing that you must ultimately learn, that guilt is always totally insane and has no reason. Ah, oh, that's from the Master. Now that I could understand. But not this other part, good guilt and bad guilt, which is almost like an underlying assumption of this world. There's certain things. Prisoners should feel guilty. People who kill people should feel guilty. Somehow guilt has a protective mechanism that helps society or helps something. And, and Jesus is like, no, your, your entire world is built on guilt. And the only way that this, this fiction, this fantasy world of, of insane projections and insane images is going to disappear is when the guilt disappears from your mind, when you accept your divine innocence. There was a Pope back at the time when St. Francis lived and he was called Pope Innocent III. And what was different about that Pope than all the other Popes is, prior to that, the other Popes had always emphasized original sin. And Pope Innocent III said, wait a minute, I think we're missing the mark here. Maybe we should be emphasizing original innocence. And to me, I thought, wow, that is, that is flipping the whole Catholic religion upside down. Because if you, if you focus on original innocence, then you don't have to call everybody a sinner. You don't have to say everybody has to pray the sinner's prayer. You don't say, have to say everybody's guilty. You know, it's like, what happened? What's prior to all of that? That seems pretty insane. Maybe there's something that was there before this crazy idea of sin. And that's, that's again why we go for, for salvation through peace. Because it has to come through peace and innocence. It doesn't come through rituals, Hail Marys, you know. There's all these things that just become props. And then you can repeat the words, but, but what, how do you feel is really the question. You know, even if you repeat the words a thousand times, does that wash the stain? You know, or maybe we need to get prior to the stain to really know who we are. Before Abraham was, I am. You know, Jesus, he said that. He taught us where to look for it before time. So yeah, we have a great, great week ahead of us to do it. And thank you, Danielle, for making the trip. And yeah, hopefully you'll just relax. Yeah, take a breath. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, sweet dreams, everyone. Thank you.